Good morning, my name is Nancy Thompson and I want to welcome you to Ask the Geriatrician, the July 2010 live webcast that will later be available on demand from mmlearn.org. I want to start by thanking Baptist Healthcare Foundation of San Antonio for their support. Without their support and other donors' support, we would not be able to produce these. We also want to thank Methodist Healthcare Ministries, the San Antonio Area Foundation, the Prior Trust, and the many other individuals and organizations who support the mission of MM Learn. Now, we want you to be interactive with this webcast. So if you look on your screen, you're going to see an ask bubble on the left in the upper corner kind of. So if you have a question that you'd like to ask, just click on the ask bubble, send us your question, and at the end the geriatrician will respond to those questions. If you um, are having any kind of problem, you can also phone us and phone in a question if you'd like at 210-264-7000. We also have people joining us on the phone and we'd really like to connect with you. So if later you would call us at that same number, 210-264-7000, we'd like to know who you are, where you are, and we'd like to send you uh, one of our DVDs. So please do uh, connect with us. It's very important to us. The other thing we'd like to say is um, we want you to come back next month in August for the uh, next Ask the Geriatrician. And next week on August the 3rd, we'll have a full day of training. And it will be free. It will be webcast. So contact us if you're interested in that day of training. Today, our very special guest is Dr. Uh, Michael J. Lichtenstein, and he is with the uh, he is the chief of the Division of Geriatrics at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. He's going to speak to us about delirium in elders. We're so happy you joined us, and Dr. Lichtenstein, thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful for the invitation to be. Uh, to talk to you about uh, the problem of uh, delirium in, uh, in older adults. Uh, this is an important problem that geriatricians uh, and families and patients uh, deal with uh, all too commonly. And it's very hard to get a picture uh, of delirium and what it's like. And the closest I've been ever able to come to is this uh, little cartoon, which is from, uh, from Dumbo, uh, the elephant. It's the pink elephants on parade. Uh, slide, uh, and when Dumbo is uh, drunk in the movie, he has this um, this wild dream. So that's uh, we're not talking about alcohol-induced delirium, uh, but there are some um, some some features and things that are that are important. So uh, what I would like you all to be able to take away from this is to be able to describe the increased risks and costs that are associated with in-hospital delirium. I'd like you to be able to recognize delirium when it occurs, you know, in a family member. Uh, would like you to be able to identify risk factors for delirium that occur both prior to a person coming to the hospital and then things that can occur inside the hospital that may uh, lead to delirium. And then I want you to be able to uh, think about steps that can be taken to prevent delirium, especially in the hospital and then thinking about uh, if somebody becomes delirious, how do you actually go ahead and uh, manage that? So that's the order of the talk, and that's what I'm going to be uh, going through uh, today. So uh, what is delirium? So it is an acute uh, confusional state. Uh, so somebody will all of a sudden change uh, in their uh, ability to attend and their ability to, uh, to think. So in contrast to uh, something like a dementing disorder, which may uh, occur gradually over time, delirium is uh, characterized by a sudden change in attention and cognition. Uh, in hospital delirium, uh, which is where it's encountered uh, most, where, where delirium is encountered most often, it's, it's very, very common. It's actually life-threatening for uh, older people. There's an increased uh, 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 death rate when people become delirious, and it is a potentially preventable uh, problem that can occur. 
So uh, it's just not good for my patients. It's not good for your family members. If you uh, are uh, an older adult, if you become delirious, it will not be good for you. So delirium leads to increased length of stay uh, in the hospital. Uh, it increases the uh, long-term care uh, placement rates. So if you're delirious, then uh, you're more likely to wind up not being able to go home and you're more likely to wind up in a, a nursing home setting. And it actually increases the, uh, the risk of dying uh, in hospital. So um, how does one actually uh, recognize delirium? How do you make this, uh, this diagnosis? So there is a screening method called the confusion assessment method. And uh, this assesses four mental status features. So the first one is the acute onset of change and a fluctuating course. Uh, the second <coughs> uh, uh, diagnostic criteria is inattention. Somebody's unable to um, uh, pay attention or follow or track along. Uh, the third is disorganized thinking, and the fourth is an altered uh, level of consciousness. And the confusion assessment method is something that can be completed in five minutes by uh, uh, a care provider. Uh, I think that uh, lay people are certainly capable of looking for these uh, uh, criteria and, and understanding that a change has occurred. And it's uh, you know, well understood by physicians, nurses, and, and lay interviewers. This has been a very well validated uh, tool for making a diagnosis of delirium. So the way this works is uh, the, uh, the first uh, feature is this acute onset of change and fluctuation in the course of, of mental status. So I'm going to give you an example, and the example is uh, something that happened to my mother-in-law. So uh, my wife uh, hosted a luncheon with, uh, with her mom several years ago, and after uh, the luncheon, my mother-in-law uh, went and laid down for a nap, and my wife cleaned up in the kitchen, but then when, uh, when my, mo my mother-in-law woke up, she uh, did not know where she was, uh, and she was completely disoriented. And this was a dramatic change from just an hour or so uh, beforehand. Uh, she was unable to pay attention to uh, what my wife was saying to her and asking questions. Uh, when we, uh, uh, on a phone conversation, I asked if uh, my, my mother-in-law had a fever and could we take a temperature. And my wife uh, asked uh, her mom where uh, the thermometer was, and she said, well, you know, it's in a tree outside. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was pretty dramatic, and she was not able to move from um, uh, and, and attend to one particular topic and stay on, uh, on track. So both of these features, uh, the acute onset and fluctuation in mental status and the inattention, have to be present then you have to have one or the other of the, uh, the other two. So either disorganized thinking, which I believe my, uh, my mother-in-law had, and uh, an altered level of consciousness. And she was a little groggy, but she was actually able to be uh, aroused. And if one and two or three or four are, are present, then uh, that makes a diagnosis of delirium. And in my mother-in-law's case, what had actually happened was she had laid down and she had the acute onset of a pneumonia and she wound up being hospitalized and her delirium was actually, it, it occurred outside the hospital, but then it carried forward into the hospitalization and made it much more complicated. So how can you tell if somebody is actually at risk of developing delirium? And from uh, work that's been done, uh, uh, by uh, Sharon Inouye, at, who was at Yale and now at uh, Harvard, uh, you need to think about these particular risk concepts. So somebody may have an underlying susceptibility that can range from a high susceptibility to of delirium to a low susceptibility. And then you need to think about the environmental stress or insult, which can be either a large insult, like being in an intensive care unit where there are many things going on, or a low insult where somebody may be on a hospital ward or in a, in a recovering and a rehabilitation unit. And theoretically, you could take somebody with a low uh, predisposition to uh, delirium and put them in an environment which is actually quite stressful where there are a lot of 
problems or uh, challenges going on to their uh, cognition and they might become delirious. Or you can take somebody who has a high underlying susceptibility to delirium and put them even in a you know, calm environment where they may still become uh, delirious because of their underlying uh, predilection. So what are the risk factors that people might actually bring to the hospital? So on the right-hand column that says adjusted RR, that's adjusted relative risk, okay? So if you are visually impaired, you are three and a half times more likely to become delirious in the hospital. If you have a severe illness and um, the criteria here were some rating scales of, uh, of severe illness, but you know, if somebody has uh, like you know, low blood pressure, breathing quickly, high fever, those are the kinds of things that would be characterized as a severe illness. That also raises the risk three and a half fold. If somebody has underlying cognitive impairment, if they already have a dementia, uh, that increases the risk by uh, 2.8 times. And if they're dehydrated, and that's what's meant by a BUN to creatinine ratio of greater than 18, if they're relatively dehydrated, um, and they haven't had a lot uh, to eat or drink in the past 24 to 48 hours, that also increases the risk. It doubles it. So you can imagine if somebody got sick at home and they weren't taking in a lot of food and nutrition and uh, before being discovered and coming to medical attention, that uh, that in itself will increase the risk of becoming uh, delirious. Once a person is in the hospital, these are the kinds of things that can uh, predispose to delirium. So the use of physical restraints is associated uh, with delirium. That increases the risk 4.4 times. Um, and you can imagine uh, if somebody is confused and they're tied down or immobilized for, due to medical necessity, they're struggling against this, they don't understand what's going on, and that just all that does is contribute to the confusion. Uh, if people are malnourished, and this is described uh, or identified by low protein levels, low albumin levels in the blood, um, that also increases the risk of delirium fourfold. If there are a lot of medication changes, either uh, medications added or switched around, uh, if there are three or more, that increases the risk three times. Uh, the use of a bladder catheter is associated with a two to four, a two to three-fold increase in the risk of delirium, and any any adverse event that uh, might be caused by care in the hospital, any iatrogenic event, something either a doctor orders something incorrectly, or the nursing staff don't follow through on things appropriately, or anything that goes on in the hospital, that can uh, double the risk for delirium. So. The, I'm going to just go back here, the baseline factors, if you, are, if you know that a family member has these, some of these issues, like vision impairment, cognitive impairment, you're going to know that. You need to understand that if they're coming into the hospital, those things increase the risk of them becoming delirious. Okay? And you need to inform the physicians and let them be aware of these, uh, these problems. Uh, and then when they're in the hospital, uh, you need to be alert for these sorts of things and asking about them uh, and, and being vigilant and talking to the healthcare team so that you can try to lower the risk of, um, of, of these things getting in the way and resulting in a delirium. Because again, remember, delirium will increase the amount of time the person has to stay in the hospital, it will increase the risk of nursing home placement, and it increases the risk of death. So um, this has actually been uh, studied if you combine, if, you, you go, if we go back to the slide about high risk and low risk in the environment, uh, if you try to group the factors, uh, the predisposing factors, the things that people bring to the hospital, and the precipitating factors, things that occur in the hospital, and you rank them from low to intermediate to high, and then cross-tabulate them, how do these things work uh, together? So uh, this slide is from a uh, cohort study, again, done at Yale. And if you look uh, at the bottom and the front of the slide there, uh, the precipitating factor, uh, that's things that happen in the hospital. High is on the uh, left-hand side, low is on the right-hand side. And then along the, the uh, three-dimensional axis going to the back, the baseline risk group from low risk factors to high risk factors. So if you don't have a lot of risk factors coming into the hospital, 
you're less likely to have uh, delirium. Uh, there were virtually hardly any cases of delirium that occurred. But if you go to um, the intermediate and high baseline risk groups, as you see, as the environment becomes more stressful, the risk of delirium goes up. So that by the time you get to a high baseline risk person, somebody coming in who's got visual impairment, dementia, they may have a severe illness, and you put them into a setting where there are lots of things happening, they're restrained, one in four people will have delirium in the hospital. And this was tested out in one group, a so-called development cohort, and a similar pattern was found in a validation cohort uh, that was done. The results weren't quite as dramatic in the validation cohort. So there is, does seem to be this interaction between what a person brings to the hospital and the things that can occur in the hospital. And again, my message to uh, everybody who's participating in today's conference is to please be aware of what your family member has <laughs> when they're coming into the hospital, understanding that that's a risk factor, and then thinking about what kinds of things are happening to them while they're in the hospital and what can be done to uh, prevent that. So, if you recognize the risk factors, can you prevent in-hospital delirium? And the answer is yes, okay? Not 100% of the time, but you can reduce the risk of delirium. So uh, what I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time telling you about is, a, again, a, one of Dr. Inouye's studies where they did a randomized control trial on a general medicine service at Yale University where they took patients who were not delirious on admission and they, they randomized them. And that means that they assigned them into two groups. One group got usual care in the hospital, you know, whatever uh, was, was going to, uh, to go on. Uh, to, to meet their medical needs. The second group was randomized to a multi-component intervention which was designed to prevent delirium. In other words, they went to a special uh, set-up ward on the hospital where uh, people were attentive specifically to the risk factors um, and what can happen in the hospital and try to, um, try to reduce those. So what was this uh, multi-focused uh, or multi-factor uh, intervention? So um, on a, every single day, uh, they would provide orienting communication, reminding the person where they were, what the day was, what the time was. And I know when you go into uh, hospitals now, uh, it's very frequent to have um, uh, uh, calendars and orienting information on the wall for the person to refer to. Uh, refer to. They would encourage early mobilization, in other words, getting rid of restraints as quickly as possible. And by restraints, I don't just mean things that are physically tying people down, like wrist restraints or, uh, or vest restraints, but things like IV catheters or bladder catheters, things that would keep people in bed longer than they need to be and get people up and around and moving as quickly as possible. Um, they would use vision and hearing aids as much as possible to optimize the person's uh, sensory input so that they would not you know, misinterpret things. Uh, they worked very hard to prevent dehydration, uh, you know, and oral rehydration is uh, preferable to IV hydration because IVs are de facto restraints. <laughs> you, can't, you can get around and walk with an IV and an IV pole, but if you're a little bit confused, uh, that's just tougher to do. Uh, they would provide uninterrupted sleep time. So uh, you wouldn't wake up a person at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, just to take a set of vital signs. Uh, if the person was, uh, was sleeping and there wasn't a medical need to do that. And then the final uh, uh, intervention or component was to avoid psychoactive drugs, things like sedative hypnotics or uh, antipsychotics. So um, these are the, um, the, the primary outcomes. So the blue bars are what happened in the intervention group and the purple bars are the usual care group. So the intervention group is to the left and the usual care group is to the right. So if you look and on the y-axis here is the number of cases of uh, delirium. And there are 426 patients in each of the two groups. So if you look at the pair of bars to the left, it's the first episode of delirium. There were 42. Uh, cases in the intervention group and 64 in the usual care group. That's about a third reduction. 
If you look at the number of days of delirium, which is in the center pair, it's 105 days of delirium in the intervention group versus 161 in the control group, about a third reduction. And if you look at the absolute number or episodes of delirium, which is the bars on the right-hand side of the slide, it's 62 case, uh, events, uh, episodes of delirium. A person can be delirious more than once uh, in the intervention group versus 90 in the con uh, control group. And if you put this then into a, a summary statistical analysis or regression analysis, the odds ratio for risk reduction for delirium is 0.6. In other words, there's a 40% reduction overall in the risk of delirium with these kinds of interventions in the hospital setting. Okay? So you're not going to be able to prevent 100% of it, but you're going to be able to prevent about a third to 40% of the, uh, the cases of delirium. Uh, this is a slide that shows the uh, cumulative incidence of delirium uh, according to the, uh, the study group. And if you look out uh, to day seven, it's days of hospitalization on the uh, x-axis and on the y-axis is the cumulative incidence of delirium. So by the, and the, the median length of stay, this again was a study that was done 11 years ago where, uh, or reported 11 years ago when lengths of stay were probably a little bit longer than they are now. But if, if you look out at, at day seven at that crosshatch bar, 10% uh, of the people in the intervention group had uh, delirium, experienced delirium versus 15% in the usual care group. So again, it's about a third reduction. And I, I think that's a, a message I really want you to take away from this today, that you, about a third of a hospital delirium can be prevented. So of the interventions, the things that were done to uh, reduce the risk of delirium, what works? Well. Um, it's really hard when you're doing these types of interventions to sort of tease apart the black box <laughs> and figure out what, uh, what really made a difference. So if you look at uh, the intervention group and the control group, the orientation scores, um, the intervention group's a little bit more oriented on this uh, score um, and uh, it it's, does not meet conventional levels of statistical significance. The big difference came in the use of sedatives. About a third of the people received sedatives in the intervention group versus about 45 to 50% in the control group. ADL scores are activities of daily living. There was no difference between the groups. If you look at vision correction, there really was no difference between the groups. Um, and it's, it's not statistically significant because of the small, small numbers. Hearing levels seem to be a little bit better in the intervention group, but again, not statistically significant. And the BUN creatinine ratio, that's the levels of dehydration. There was no difference uh, between the two groups. So the one area which seemed to make uh, the biggest difference in the intervention was changing the prescribing uh, practices. So if somebody becomes confused in the hospital, the answer isn't necessarily just give them a drug. <laughs> Um, and if, if somebody's having difficulty sleeping before they develop delirium, the answer is not necessarily give them a drug, don't give them a sleeping aid. There are other ways to try to help people uh, sleep effectively in the hospital setting. So um, again, th the messages are you can prevent about a third of the cases of delirium and the thing that makes the biggest difference, it looks like it's the use of sedative hypnotic drugs or psychoactive drugs in, in older people. So once a delirium occurs, if you haven't been able to prevent it, how are you going to manage this? And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of science to direct this. So things like the confusion assessment method, uh, the risk factors, the uh, preventing delirium, there's a good evidence base. There's, there are good clinical studies that tell us uh, you know, what we can do and what seems to work. What we don't have are the same quality of studies for um, uh, how to effectively uh, to manage delirium. There are lots of things that can cause delirium. So the first thing you need to do is uh, under, um, find underlying precipitating factors. So um, there's this uh, mnemonic delirium. <laughs> And you can go down the list of things that may, uh, may cause, cause problems. So if I'm asked to see a patient who has new onset delirium in the hospital, I'm going to go down a list 
uh, something like this. So the thing I'm going to look for first is changes in drug use. And I'm going to go to the medication administration record and I'm going to look very carefully at what drugs have been started and I'm going to look very carefully at what drugs have been stopped. Because somebody can become delirious in a withdrawal syndrome if a, if a medication has been inappropriately discontinued. Um, if somebody has had some psychoactive drugs uh, started that might cause a delirium, I'm going to be looking very, very carefully for, uh, for that as an underlying cause. Um, I'm going to look uh, really hard for electrolyte uh, abnormalities, especially things like low sodium levels, uh, which can occur very frequently in the hospital and from a variety of causes. Um, L is for lack of drugs. I've covered that in the D part here about withdrawal. Uh, if, if people have been on a benzodiazepine for a long period of time, like if somebody has taken Valium or, um, uh, 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 or Librium uh, or you know, any of these other agents for a long period of time, if that stopped suddenly uh, without a, uh, in the hospital, that in itself can cause a, a, a delirium and withdrawal. Another really common and treatable cause of delirium is infection. So my mother-in-law's example of developing a pneumonia. Um, what I frequently see also are urinary tract infections. So for my patients who are in, um, uh, have cognitive impairment, if all of a sudden they're a little bit more confused, uh, one of the first things we wind up looking for are uh, urinary tract infections. Um, reduced sensory input, uh, again, recognizing that vision impairment especially can lead to uh, confusional states. People misinterpret visual cues and uh, may become frightened and confused by this. Uh, hearing impairment can cause uh, no man all sorts of uh, communication problems, especially in a noisy setting like the hospital. Um, less frequently, intracranial problems, things like strokes, bleeding. If somebody's had a seizure, the postictal state, they may be confused. Uh, urinary retention and, uh, and fecal impaction. One of the uh, major preventable causes for urinary retention, you know, people use uh, over-the-counter um, antihistamines, things like Benadryl, uh, to uh, help them sleep or to treat allergies, but it, that can sometimes cause confusion, delirium, and also throw people into urinary in, uh, retention. Um, uh, fecal impaction uh, can also uh, uh, sneak up on folks and, uh, and, and cause uh, confusion. And then finally, any myocardial problems, uh, either uh, heart failure or, or rhythm disturbances uh, can, can lead to delirium. So this is a, a checklist that uh, healthcare professionals will go through if they're called upon to see somebody in the hospital setting. It's also something if a delirium occurs in the outpatient setting that I'm going to be going down this list and uh, trying to make a diagnosis. So then um, once you've identified delirium, uh, you know, how, how are you going to management, manage it? So there are uh, psychiatric criteria. It's not the DSM-4 anymore. I think we have the DSM-5, uh, which psychiatrists use for uh, their definitions, or you can use the confusion assessment method, the CAM. Um, and then uh, you'll go through a review of the medications. Uh, focused history and physical should be done looking for um, potentially reversible uh, causes. Uh, basic laboratory tests, uh, a complete blood count to look for uh, anemia or a high white cell count that might be suggestive of infection. Uh, we'll look at glucose levels. Uh, you know, somebody can become confused if their blood sugar levels are too low or too high. Uh, we'll look at electrolytes, uh, especially the uh, sodium levels. Uh, calcium levels, if they're too high, can cause lethargy and confusion. Um, uh, BUN to creatinine, again, that's a, a ratio that is indicative of, um, of dehydration. Uh, urinalysis uh, to look for uh, underlying infections. Pulse oximetry will tell us whether or not somebody's getting adequate uh, oxygen levels. We can tell that very quickly. And then an electrocardiogram, an EKG, to look for, for heart problems. So if there is an offending drug, which, again, people should think about first, stop the drug. <laughs> um, if there is evidence of trauma or some sort of focal finding on the neurologic exam, if, like if you're worried that somebody may have had a stroke or uh, 
you know, if somebody has fallen and it's a few days later, they're confused um, and they're a little weak on one side, you would go ahead and do a CT scan of the brain or some other imaging study. If you find a focus of infection, like a urinary tract infection, prescribe an appropriate antibiotic to clear that up. If uh, nuchal rigidity refers to a stiff neck, lots of people have stiff necks because of arthritis. This is referring to a stiff neck because you're worried that there actually may be an infection uh, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the central nervous system in the brain. This is, in point of fact, very uncommon, but if you suspect that, then you need to do a, a lumbar puncture. There are some settings where people can get um, uh, uh, pneumococcal meningitis. Uh, uh, that's something that older people may be predisposed to uh, in certain settings, but again, this is very, very unusual. And then if there's no uh, obvious etiology, if you can't figure out after you've gone through this, then there are other tests that can be done looking for things like uh, vitamin deficiencies, thyroid problems, an EEG, an electroencephalogram, an MRI scan, looking at levels of drugs, uh, if there are other drugs, and doing a toxin screen. By the time you've gotten to the lower right-hand corner of the slide, you've exhausted the common things, and the yield of these tests is not likely to be very high. And oftentimes, you may not identify an underlying cause for the delirium, and then you just have to try to manage the person uh, through this episode until they recover. So um, the first thing to do in the management is to institute supportive measures. And these are very simple things. So you want to make sure that they're eating and drinking enough to maintain their hydration and their nutrition. You want to avoid restraints. This is very, very important. Um, uh, actually, restraint use, we think of it in, in the hospital, we've, we've learned that it actually increases the risk of falls and injury to have people restrained. So you really have to rely on uh, other behavioral methods and only restrain people if they're at a, a risk to themselves or to other people. And it's really interfering with necessary uh, medical care. You want to mobilize. Um, people as quickly as you can, get them up out of bed into a chair, get them up out of the chair and get them walking as quickly as possible. You want to reduce noise in the environment. Uh, have it be as quiet as possible so that when people are um, talking to them, they're able to focus on one message. So things like television should be turned off uh, and there shouldn't be uh, multiple uh, competition for, uh, for, uh, uh, for attention from different uh, sound stimuli. Um, there should be orienting stimuli to remind the person uh, where they are. Uh, the, your presence when you come in to see the patient, you should have a reassuring presence uh, and uh, not be anxious yourself. Uh, if you're anxious, then that will be uh, communicated to the, uh, to the patient and they will worry more. And perhaps having bedside sitters rather than restraining somebody is a way to uh, manage and maintain somebody and have them uh, watch more closely in the hospital. So if you do all those things, if you do these supportive measures and the person is still has this confusional state which interferes with their care or safety, you have to take other action. So I'll, I'll give you another personal example. Uh, several years ago, my demented mother fell and broke her hip and had a hip replacement. And uh, when she came out of the operating room and uh, was in, uh, she had to have a wedge between her legs so that she couldn't cross her legs. And we were, even though we were getting her up, she was you know, functionally restrained. She had a Foley catheter. And for her to get up, would have been disastrous in the first 24 to 48 hours because it would have put her uh, hip replacement at, uh, at risk. So her confusion, her agitation, even though we were managing the pain, the narcotics themselves made her uh, delirious, um, she needed to be, um, she needed to be, uh, be medicated for this. So, we had a medical necessity in the first 24 to 48 hours to manage her delirium and to try to keep her safe and allow her hip replacement to, um, um, to, uh, to begin to heal. So um, if you can say that the patient behavior inter interferes with their care and safety and supportive measures by themselves are not sufficient, 
then the current uh, state of the art is to, and it's the state of the art, it's not the state of the science. The current state of the art is to use a low dose neuroleptic, something like Haldol or Risperidol or uh, Quetiapine, which is Seroquel, to try to manage the person and to, uh, to calm them down. This is very, very controversial, and there is not any good science for how to do this, and I think that um, healthcare providers, myself included, we find ourselves in circumstances where we're re very, very uncomfortable to prescribe these things, but we feel we have to as sort of a last-ditch attempt, and uh, we're, we're really looking forward to uh, newer studies that may actually give us more guidance on how to... Uh, how to deal with things once we're at this step. If you're going to prescribe or if a neuroleptic is going to be prescribed, you have to continue the evaluation and treatment and as soon as the person doesn't need it anymore, then um, you uh, go ahead and taper and stop the, uh, the, uh, uh, the neuroleptic. So again, in my mother's case, uh, she needed it for a longer period of time, but a year and a half out from her uh, surgery, uh, she was in a care situation where things were calmer and less distracting and uh, were actually able to uh, taper and stop uh, actually all of her psychotropic uh, medications. But this was an example where in an acute setting, her behaviors were interfering with her care and it was necessary to medicate her for a short period of time. But you always wanted to use the lowest effective dose for the shortest amount of time uh, under these circumstances. Um, if the person's behavior does not interfere with their care or safety, don't use the drugs and continue to evaluate and, and treat. And in the hospital setting, this is uh, around the clock. I mean, the nurses should be evaluating uh, the person in the hospital every shift and the physicians should be doing it at least once a day and recording what kind of progress is or is not being made and the rationale for uh, using particular treatments uh, in, in frail older people. So the unresolved problems that we have is that we really don't yet understand the biology or underlying pathophysiology of delirium. And there's lots more research and work that has to be done to um, understand what happens that actually triggers the development of delirium uh, in, in patients. And then once a delirium has developed, uh, we need more effective means for, uh, for managing people safely and, uh, and effectively. So uh, that concludes my comments, and I'll be happy to, uh, to answer questions. So. Um, all right, so the first question is, how does the person with dementia change with delirium, and what should a family member uh, look for? So, uh, you know, people who are demented are often confused and disoriented, and you should look for a relative change. The confusion, their level of function should actually get worse, and it will be a, uh, a sudden change, something that will occur over, uh, you know, 24 hours uh, or so. It can actually be more rapid than that. Uh, going back to the example of my, um, uh, my mother-in-law, she developed her delirium within the space of an hour after a luncheon. <laughs> uh, and that was just the acute onset of a, uh, of a pneumonia. So if you have somebody if, who's demented and if they got an underlying infection, you would see within hours a change in their, uh, in their mental status. They might become more agitated, they might become more irritable. Um, it, uh, it, it all just depends. Um, I think uh, family members uh, know their affected family member, <laughs> their, their affected loved one better than anyone. So if you believe that there's been a sudden change uh, as a uh, physician, I would listen very carefully to you I would ask questions about what might the source be, uh, going down that list, that mnemonic, the delirium uh, uh, mnemonic of, of things that might be causing it, and then do a very focused and quick evaluation of the problem to try to get uh, treatment in place. Um, okay. It is, is it important for a family member to stay with a patient in the hospital to be able to provide accurate information on behalf of the patient? Uh, yes. <laughs> so um, 
I, I'm going to go back to my uh, my uh, my family's experience. So um, when um, my my wife, after uh, my mother-in-law uh, recovered from her pneumonia, her heart failure, and her delirium, uh, my wife came back and said, "I wouldn't leave anybody who I loved <coughs> alone in a hospital. Uh, you wouldn't leave an infant in a hospital by themselves." Uh, the same thing is true for a frail older pe person who's cognitively impaired. They do not have the mental faculty or resources to be able to fend for themselves. So, you know, if a family member can't be there, then you've got to find help. Either you hire sitters or somebody, but somebody who can be the advocate, who can be the eyes and ears for the person um, while they're in the, uh, the, the, hos the hospital. So the, the second question, is there a benefit to having a family member there at the hospital for the patient? The answer is unequivocally yes. Um, uh, the, the family becomes the advocate for the older person who cannot uh, fend for themselves. If, uh, if an older person is uh, cognitively intact, you know, and if they can speak and communicate and if the staff are sensitive to whatever deficits they have, um, then, you know, that may not be uh, an absolute, um, uh, but if, if somebody has a delirium, then absolutely uh, there ought to be somebody there who can um, uh, be, their, be their guardian. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lichtenstein. Sure. The next part of this exercise is for you to complete the survey. You're going to see that in the upper right corner. Click on the survey. Please take it because that lets us know whether or not you like what you're getting, what else we need to do, how we can change this. We also want to ask the people who are listening on the phone to call us at area code 210-264-7000. That number was posted earlier. We spoke about it earlier. So please call us and we'll send you a DVD from one of our programs so that you'll have that available to you. But please complete the survey. And I want to remind you that this will also be available on demand. It was great information. I learned a lot today. So I'd encourage you to tell people about the uh, Ask the Geriatrician series, this one in particular, and encourage people to watch it. And if there are things that you didn't um, understand or you would like to hear again, go back and watch this another time. And of course, we want to end by thanking the people and the organizations who have been so supportive of mmlearn.org, the Baptist Health Foundation of San Antonio the Methodist Healthcare Ministries, San Antonio Area Foundation, the Prior Trust, and all of the mmlearn.org donors. Don't forget that we have a training available on August the 31st, and next month we'll again have training uh, delivered to you and also ask the geriatrician. Thanks very much. <laughs>